almost invisible, right? Um, if you're spending time here in the Front Range or down in Denver, very unlikely that you're going to see um, a horse making its way down the street. In fact, probably the only time you'll see um, horses in some sort of functional transportation role, unless you're out in the countryside on the dude ranch might be something like this, right? Like a novelty carriage, maybe somebody had for, for a wedding or for a fancy event, right? Um, nonetheless, we see the, the sort of um, hoof prints for lack of a, a, a less kitschy term, uh, the legacy of horses and the impact that they recently had all around us, right? Anywhere from uh, the how deeply horses are embedded in our popular culture, right? Um, even my daily commute to work from Longmont to Boulder uh, follows this Highway 119 that, you know, um, 120 years ago uh, started out as a as a horse trail, right? Um, while horses might have retreated significantly in their visibility from our day-to-day -day lives, um, particularly here in the United States, there are many parts of the world, including parts of the United States, where horses haven't retreated, where they still retain um, kind of a core aspect of day-to-day -day life um, as both a, a livestock animal and uh, as a main form of transport. And uh, a good example of this is um, where I do a lot of my work in the steppes of Mongolia, right? Where outside of a few urban centers, um, folks still uh, get around for the most part on horseback. Now, for those of you who've chosen to come to a talk about horses tonight, um, but really for, for many people all across the Western US, um, horses probably play some kind of a special uh, role in your life, um, your culture, your history. My own interest in the subject um, is for the same reason. So I grew up in Montana, but uh, I grew up as the kind of the first generation of a family um, that didn't grow up on a ranch, right? My grandfather and my father uh, both horses were um, just an absolutely central part of their day-to-day -day life. Um, and I was probably the first generation in my family um, where I didn't spend much time around horses. And so for me, understanding the relationship uh, between people and horses is a little bit um, of the process of understanding my own family's story um, and the culture and the world that I Grew up in that was deeply shaped by horses. Now, while we, when we talk about horses in places like Colorado here, we're often guilty of doing what I've just done, which is showing you, you know, some dramatic picture of, of a cowboy. Here it can be forgiven because this is my grandpa here. But, um, but the truth is, many of the most significant impacts that the horse has had on the Great Plains and on this part of the world. Uh, were on indigenous societies. After horses were introduced here, um, we saw that um, really across the American West, uh, the emergence of some of the world's greatest and most significant horse cultures. Um, here in Colorado, right, where uh, the, the University of Colorado, where I work, sits on the traditional territories of folks like the Ute, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, but also um, groups like the Pawnee, Comanche. Um, there's actually 47 uh, federally recognized groups who uh, have traditional connections to this territory that, uh, of the state of Colorado. And the truth is that the vast majority of folks around here um, have a very special and significant relationship with horses. Unfortunately, um, for, for better or for worse, and, and um, probably mostly for worse, the story of the horse um, over the 20th century and into the 21st has mostly been told um, within the United States uh, through the perspective of the discipline of history, through historical records that have come to us 
by their very definition, right? Uh, through the limited and sometimes biased lens, um, often biased and sometimes hatefully biased lens of European histories. And um, this, the collective impact of the story of horses and people in the Great Plains being told through the lens of, of European historical records has been uh, to sort of mischaracterize or minimize um, the antiquity and the significance of that relationship between indigenous peoples and horses. And so if you, like me, um, become curious about, you know, uh, the origin of, of horsemanship in the Great Plains or the Rockies, and you, you dig into the history books a little bit, it won't be long before you end up encountering a diagram that looks something like the one you see here on the screen. Now, uh, this is uh, kind of a map with various arrows showing how horses sort of radiated out of northward from, from Spanish Mexico into various parts of the plains. But let me see if I can get my little pin here. Uh, one thing that it won't take you too long to notice is that um, the, the dates that you often see associated on a little map like this are very suspicious viciously similar uh, to the dates of the first really significant established European presence in a given part of the Western United States, right? And so um, the uh, risk with relying primarily on historical documents is that rather than expertly mapping the spread of the horses, Really, what we've done is expertly mapped the spread of European people and uh, conflated that with an early and effective history of, of horses. Now, um, yeah, so, <clears throat> so many of these um, observers were written down by, uh, observations were recorded by folks um, that uh, were doing their best to, to faithfully, you know, chronicle, understand, or document um, what was going on with, with indigenous peoples and horses. Folks like George Catlin, this, this um, painter depicted here. Um, but even the folks that were the most sort of uh, well-meaning, empathetic, thoughtful, carried with them um, a whole host of sort of uh, cultural baggage, myopic worldview, and limited understanding of processes that began playing out um, in some cases, maybe centuries before their arrival. And I think that this uh, perspective has not always been just a harmless mistake, right? Um, the, the cumulative impact of uh, this historical bias has meant that oftentimes in popular culture or even in academic works, and I have you know, apologies to, to Jared Diamond for putting him on, um, on blast here, but um, horses are often lumped in with things like uh, metallurgy and guns as uh, a technology of European origin whose primary uh, impact on the sort of uh, North and South America, indigenous peoples of North and South America was uh, a sort of, as a colonial tool, right? That enabled their ultimate subjugation by European peoples. And I think that uh, many folks in attendance tonight and, and hopefully uh, as we go through the talk will probably uh, vehemently disagree with this characterization. But I think that um, part of the problem, you know, ultimately uh, returns to this over-reliance on historical records as the way of, of tracing that relationship. And I'll just kind of give you a little vignette, a little example of what academic history of people and horses has very often looked like. Here's a quote from one of the most influential early scholars on the introduction of horses and the way that they've impacted indigenous societies. And he states kind of point blank that he suspects 
that the Comanche, who uh, even he and, and many early white historians would widely recognize as this sort of great horse culture, um, he strongly implies that they may not have actually been able to breed horses on their own power, that all the horses that indigenous peoples had gathered would have been through trade or through raiding. Ideas like this, uh, despite seeming uh, to be sort of nonsensical, um, are actually perniciously widespread in the historical and even archeological literature. Ideas that um, minimize the skill, competency, and antiquity of the relationship between indigenous folks and horses. Um, and so um, in most, uh, I don't know why my little red scriggle didn't go away, um, but even today in most um, historical circles, the best or most widely accepted model for when horses made their way into the Great Plains uh, is the idea that after permanent Spanish occupation in, in New Mexico was ended temporarily through the Pueblo Revolt, this kind of cats away, the mice will play type of scenario where it took a full retreat of European colonial powers from the American Southwest for uh, indigenous folks to gain access to horses, to spread them through trade um, and this sort of thing. And this uh, in many circles today is still a sort of a um, intellectual status quo. Okay, so now that I've dis um, horribly disparaged the whole discipline of, of early hi history of horses and, and people in North America, um, I think it, uh, it's incumbent to provide some alternatives, right? If we're not going to build these perspectives fully on uh, historical documents, what other alternatives do we have? And uh, I'm strategically in tonight's talk going to sidestep uh, perhaps the most important source, which is uh, indigenous sources, right? Because as a white archeologist, this isn't really my uh, place to tell you about. But uh, as I'll pitch to you at the end of today's lecture, we have a wonderful speaker on this topic who's um, going to be here next week that hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do that. I'm gonna to talk to you about another um, source of insights, um, ways that we might be able to fill in these gaps or correct some of these biases left um, through the historical record. And that is lessons from um, archaeozoology. What I do primarily is um, to study the bones of um, animal remains from archaeological sites. This uh, discipline sometimes folks call zooarchaeology purely for aesthetic reasons. I use the word archaeozoology. So if that upsets you, I'm sorry. Um, I just like the way the word sounds a little nicer. It's a little bit less clunky. Um, all right, and in order to, to establish uh, how we go about this, I'm gonna take us very, very briefly all the way across the world um, from the Rocky Mountains here um, to the other place that, I, that occupies most of my thoughts and, um, and time, which is the grassy steppes of Mongolia, literally almost as far away from Boulder, Colorado as, as you could get on the globe. Now, uh, for now, I, I, I saw on the guest list, right, that I have some of uh, my Mongolian friends in attendance. So this comment does not apply. But for, for folks like me that grew up here in the States, when you think of Mongolia, you probably don't um, have like a, a rich uh, set of concepts or ideas to pull upon. You probably think of, of one thing in particular, right, which is uh, the conquests of folks like Genghis or Kublai Khan, right? These great horse warrior nomadic empires. Um, you know, uh, maybe you listen to some hardcore history podcasts or, you know, but it, probably you, what comes to mind, one of uh, in, what in later centuries became one of the world's most 
um, significant right horse cultures. Now, it just so happens that in Mongolia, just as in um, in, in Mongolia and in, and in East Asia, just as in North America, the story uh, of horse domestication, the story of how horses were introduced and the way they impacted societies is also uh, not really properly captured through the lens of history. Now, in East Asia, history uh, is really a largely a Chinese affair, right? The first uh, written language was of, of the region was developed in China. Ultimately, the history books, um, you know, ult ultimately run through the great political centers of Chinese empires. And if you know anything about Asia, um, you might know that they're not particularly favorable to uh, the nomadic horse cultures of Mongolia, which <laughs> plagued them for centuries, both politically, economically, militarily, right? And so for the longest time, a historical framework that would explain sort of the introduction or the origins of Mongolia's very unique and very significant horse culture uh, really put the uh, power and the influence um, in the hands of Chinese states. So one of the most common uh, answers to when and where horses were introduced in Mongolia was to say that, well, this was probably a bit of a accidental outcome of the rise of the great Han state, right? Um, towards the end of the first millennium BC, as China really became great, then as an outcome, right, these displaced folks at the edge had to sort of figure something out, right? And they got angry or, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of comedically oversimplifying um, this narrative, but it's a real and very long lasting academic narrative for the origins of horse culture in Mongolia. Now, uh, when archeology span began to take this question a little bit more seriously, right? And particularly over the, over recent decades, um, we began to encounter things that really don't align very nicely with that narrative, right? Beginning as early as um, the end of the second millennium BC, Mongolia seems to develop an incredibly rich archaeological record that seems in many ways to suggest uh, some elements of horse culture, perhaps horse riding, uh, really these clues that would suggest the roots of this um, cultural development might go back a thousand years before anything shows up in these Chinese historical records. Um, primarily, these come from individual sort of ritual horse burials, which you can see in this beautiful little schematic made by my talented mother. Um, outside of uh, these stone, stone standing stones, which we call deer stones. Now we call them deer stones. You can see a little bit in this photo. Um, because of these elaborate, beautiful deer images with their cool antlers here. But um, at the margins of these stone monuments and um, associated stone burials, there are sometimes a small handful, right? And sometimes hundreds or in some cases, even thousands of uh, the partial skeletal remains of sacrificed horses. Now, before we started working on this, we really couldn't say much more than that, uh, whether they were wild horses, domestic horses, et cetera. But we have this really big data set of horse bones that we could start to potentially uh, use to understand Mongolia's earliest centuries of that human horse relationship, um, not captured by the historic records. Now, I'm gonna just blow through what amounts to like, <laughs> 10 years of scholarship here. So if this stuff interests you, um, feel free to ask some questions, you know, after the talk here, or um, there's plenty of things you can read. But um, essentially, uh, through a detailed study of the skeletal remains that we found in these early Mongolian archaeological sites, 
we were able to conclusively identify that these animals were bridled, that they were used for transportation. Here's just an example, this kind of skeletal deformation that's actually caused by a particular configuration of a bridle with a, with a nose band there. Um, through uh, looking, expanding our data sets to um, other aspects of the, the bones that we recovered, we were able to identify patterning in the age and the sex of animals that were chosen for these features, allowing us to say, yes, they were these, um, this deer stone culture was actually clearly managing a breeding herd. Uh, we were able to actually re reconstruct particular kinds of bridal equipment that they would have been using with these horses. And in a paper that just came out yesterday, we actually may, um, may have found a way to, to identify the use of chariots, in fact, even though all we have here is, is the skull. And then finally, we have uh, some information that totally flips our narrative of the sort of uh, intellectual achievements of, of these nomadic cultures, right? Um, this deerstone culture produced what amounts to the world's uh, first evidence of veterinary dentistry in horses. So a really incredible set of um, sophisticated cultural developments linked to the management of horses. And we're able to kind of squeeze all of this um, out of an analysis of the bones. We also have been able to, over the years, learn quite a bit through um, an emerging field of archaeological science that I'm just going to call uh, biomolecules, right? This is things like um, DNA or stable isotopes or radiocarbon dating. Um, by applying, taking advantage of some of the emerging technologies um, that are preserving clues inside uh, bones that can't be observed with the naked eye, uh, we're able to add a whole other suite of additional tools to our toolkit here. This allows us to do things like take unidentifiable scraps of animal bone um, to screen them using very uh, quick and easy laboratory techniques that allow us to identify the species and pair these with ancient DNA to, to learn things in great detail about an individual specimen that might otherwise, you know, even 20 years ago, been cast aside by an archeologist um, and not even saved in a, in a collection. Some examples of what a very quick um, and increasingly affordable DNA analysis can tell us about um, an ancient horse specimen are things like their coat color or uh, particular traits such as the um, alleles linked with stamina or speed, right? There's a growing list of actual significant uh, physical traits that we're able to quickly reconstruct, not me, but some of our partners are able to quickly reconstruct through um, a look at the animal's DNA. And then um, finally, uh, we've been able to do quite a lot with radiocarbon dating. And uh, in this case in Mongolia, by sort of um, drawing together all of the published radiocarbon dates from these type of features and uh, doing a whole lot more dates, we're actually able to produce a little bit of a model for um, the timing of the introduction of horses into Mongolia and sort of assess whether there was geographic patterning. So some other things that I didn't talk about, but have also um, other folks have also learned important things about things like um, how horses were being fed or when people started using horses for milk using some of the other emerging techniques. Um, so ultimately, uh, what I wanted to show you here is that the work in Mongolia is showing us that archaeozoology and paired with this kind of biomolecular archaeology is allowing us to sort of fill in some of the gaps, um, particularly those that can come from um, a biased or incomplete historical record um, that may not appropriately distinguish the antiquity or the um, intellectual cultural achievements of, uh, you know, horse cultures. Okay. 
So uh, the important question of the night, what can this type of archaeology tell us about the relationship between people and horses in North America? Um, and when I first started asking this question years and years ago, as a grad student at the University of New Mexico, almost everyone would rapidly chime in with a, a specific answer. That answer, maybe it's going through some of your heads right now, is not much, right? And the reason folks uh, had a tendency to give this answer is that in comparison, right, to uh, these beautiful thousands of horse burials that I've just shown you, um, horse remains are, at least at first blush, seemingly scarce in the American archaeological record. Um, when horse remains are found on something like an archaeological site report, it might be that there's one or two bones. And because there's not large numbers, researchers will often say this could be intrusive, right? We don't actually know if this is an early horse or if this is like uh, Bob the rancher's horse, which died there, you know, several hundred in, in 1943. Uh, and we're not going to go much further with it. Um, so there was a lot of sort of resistance or discouragement um, to start off this project. And in some ways for good reason, in other ways for not. And what I'm gonna do here is just cycle through three case studies, which I think show, um, they illustrate some of the problems that prevented folks from recognizing the importance of the archeozoological record of horses in North America. And more importantly, they really demonstrate the utility of this approach in sort of moving the needle, um, maybe filling in some of those historical biases and giving us a more complete picture of the relationship between indigenous folks and horses in this part of the world. So I'm gonna start off uh, with a case study from um, essentially the Southern margin of, of uh, Salt Lake City in Utah, Lehigh, Utah is, um, at this point, uh, probably a suburb, um, somewhere in between uh, Salt Lake and Provo. Apologies if I've butchered the geography. I haven't spent a lot of time out there, but um, this came to our attention through a story that uh, was the first time, but it certainly wouldn't be the last time, of a, a popular news article about a Pleistocene horse. This was actually, believe it or not, in the U New York Times, where folks, uh, a family that was doing some remodeling at their house, kind of carved into a sandbank and came out with this horse bone. And it was believed, based on the age of the sediments it was found in, that these this horse dated to the late ice age. But there was some funniness. There was some there was some funkiness about this horse and. The very first thing that came to my mind, the article reported that the horse experienced severe arthritis um, and it was an old horse. Now I've looked at a lot of skeletons of wild animals over the years and they almost never have major mobility problems nor are they often very, very old, right? Because both of those conditions are things that make somebody particularly valuable for a predator, right? Those animals, Wild animals don't often live to old age with big mobility problems, right? Um, so we started to poke into it a little bit more. And one of the things when we decided to visit this collection, one of the first things we found was an apparent uh, piece of lithic debitage that was associated with um, the sediment that the horse came out of. So we actually sort of revisited some, some photos of the site and, uh, oops, there we go. Um, it actually looks upon closer inspection like this horse might have been buried in something like a pit, right? This, uh, this wasn't necessarily identified by the initial um, geologists, although it was discussed, but on retrospect, it, it, it looks really as though um, this horse might have not have been found in the initial Pleistocene sediments, but some kind of a cultural feature actually dug into them. Um, so uh, what can we learn about people from this material? Well, um, 
the very first, as we sat down and, and look at this skeletal material here, the very first thing that we looked for was something that um, is essentially the smoking gun for mounted horseback riding. In Eurasia, and this is from a paper actually from Northwest China from, from a year or two ago, um, you, showing the, the frequency of pathologies in the horse's back for animals that have been ridden, right? And in this case, ridden without a, without a saddle, right? And you can see basically the, the middle and the lower back here sometimes get very, very extreme levels of pathology that really does not occur this way in wild horses. Well, oh, my little scribbles have ruined it. Um, we found essentially the exact same pattern here in our, in our Lehigh horse major pathological bone formation to the middle of the back here, as well as, you know, to the lower limbs. And it was not just the location of the pathology, but the kind of pathology that's particularly useful for us. Things like um, the impinging of the dorsal spinous processes, or in particular, these thin kind of cracks on the sort of rear um, articular surface of, of the vertebrae, um, really tend to be quite characteristic of mounted horseback riding. And um, the other thing about this patterning is that they're actually asymmetric. So the bone formation, pathological bone formation that we see is oftentimes or, or uh, most of the time occurring, occurring either exclusively or largely on the animal's left side, which we haven't totally figured out why. Um, but is also probably uh, a symptom of uh, the horseback riding process. So all of a sudden, osteologically, uh, after a quick look at this Ice Age horse, it seems very clear that it's not, right? But we, we sorry, that was my dog trying to get here. He's a puppy and he seems grumpy about not being in the office. Um, we tested the DNA of the horse to prove it. And uh, through analysis of the DNA, we convincingly determined that this was a domestic horse rather than the Pleistocene wild horses that um, are native to North America. We also discovered that the animal was female. So this is interesting because elderly female horses um, are one category of animal that we often find in pastorally managed archaeological sites. That's because older uh, younger female animals are really valuable for breeding, and it's only when they reach sort of the age of uh, reproductive senescence that they're often selected for sacrifice or, or death. And uh, in this case, because this horse has severe arthritis and mobility issues, it may be actually that the animal was maintained in the old age um, so as uh, to still be useful from a reproductive standpoint. And then finally, radiocarbon dating showed us very clearly that this is a, a early historic horse. Because of the way radiocarbon dating works, we, we probably can't parse out um, the age really, really carefully. But in all likelihood, it was between 1680 and the permanent Mormon occupation in the 19th century. Okay. So now we're going to show you two quick case studies here that I think really uh, force us to rethink our understanding of the spread of horses into North America. The first of these comes from um, a site in southwestern Wyoming called Black's Fork. This is uh, the Black's Fork of the Green River. Beautiful country. You might have driven through here if you've been on the, the interstate, right? Uh, this was a site discovered in the in the 1990s by um, uh, during some, I believe, CRM work, but analyzed by archaeologists, including those at the University of Wyoming. Um, the site consists of a disarticulated or partially disarticulated juvenile horse, about six months old. And um, it, the initial radiocarbon analysis of the horse brought back some very, very early dates, dates that are earlier than they should have been, given our understanding of horses, you know, reaching north after the Pueblo Revolt. And while uh, a settled interpretation of the site was not necessarily consistent across some of the various scholars that have analyzed and published it over the years, one idea uh, was that this horse uh, was somehow uh, 
uh, escaped from an undocumented Spanish foray north um, and then killed by indigenous folks who didn't know what the animal was. There were a lot of cut marks on the animal. Um, and so that fed into that interpretation. However, right, the horse was actually buried with three canid skulls as well, um, probably coyote. They were identified as coyote. Um, and its function, its location in this sort of uh, apparently ritual pit structure uh, really raises a lot of questions about that potential interpretation. So we had a deeper dive into the um, into this the osteology of this specimen, and I'm showing you here a, a quick little 3D model of of this skull. One of the very first things that uh, became apparent is that the animal actually had a major injury to uh, this kind of crescent shaped fracture of the kind of the upper nose region here. Probably this was caused by a kick and the injury itself has completely healed over. Um, the kick injuries do occur in both wild and domestic animals, but the most likely case for an animal this young to, to have received such a serious injury um, is perhaps it was kept being kept in close quarters with other animals. Now, the fact that they, the um, injury has healed um, might suggest that the animal was cared for. Um, I'm skipping through a couple of things just so we don't uh, run over time because I want to wrap it up here relatively soon. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of this animal, though, is the bone formation at the back of the head, the area we, we would call the knuckle crest. This is a pretty rare thing to find in wild animals. In fact, a few years ago, we did some analysis comparing this type of feature on ridden horses versus wild horses. And we found that really these high levels of bone formation, like we see in this skull, um, really almost don't occur in wild animals. And when they do, it's often, you know, it would be expected to be a, an adult with a heavy head or, or something like that. Um, most likely explanation for this strange skeletal patterning is that this animal was um, perhaps tethered while uh, perhaps while it was healing. Something that would have com confined the animal's posture and allowed this bone formation to develop back there. Um, we did some stable isotope analysis as well, which I'm not gonna get into much about the details, but essentially they allow us to assess the idea that the animal was traded in or wandered in or came in through some kind of a Spanish foray. And really the results show us that um, this specimen is quite consistent with what we would expect if it were born and died right here in this little corner of southwestern Wyoming. So all told, this is an indigenous horse. It's a horse that was born and raised in this corner of Wyoming. It's an animal that received probably some kind of uh, special attention or health care, right? And then uh, our radiocarbon dating, um, now that we've gotten a few more dates and with the work of, of um, Cassidy Thornhill, who had just published a great paper on this subject, uh, we can be really, really confident that this date uh, predates the Pueblo Revolt here, right? So this is a, a, a very rapid and very far north dispersal of horses um, that comes purely through an indigenous uh, context of management. Okay, final little case study here, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. This is uh, comes from essentially downtown Lawrence, Kansas, the banks of of the Kaw or the Kansas River here. In 1910 or 1911, believe it or not, an old bloke, a paleontologist, was walking um, down the banks and he encountered this beautiful horse skull. Um, he uh, was quite pleased with this discovery and decided that he discovered a new species of wild Pleistocene horse, which he called Equus Laurentius. You're starting to notice a pattern developing here, right? About um, horses being assumed to be Pleistocene in nature and entering not the archeological collections, but the paleontological ones. However, uh, a researcher by the name of Eric Scott and a paleontological team started to notice damage to the teeth of this horse, which really, um, in archaeological circles, we would call bit wear, right? 
damage to the dentition caused through interaction with a metal mouthpiece um, were what he at least suspected was bit wear. So he did some radiocarbon dating. And once again, we have a specimen that very clearly dates to the early to mid part um, of the 17th century here. We had a deeper dive at the osteology of this horse, and we found several other osteological problems which are clearly linked to human activity. That includes um, kind of fracturing of, of the palate area and um, a kind of a osteoarthritis of the lower jaw. Um, when we combine all these things together and think about the um, the kinds of equipment used in the 17th century, um, it's actually likely that all of these features are directly caused by the use of uh, these kind of 17th century metal bits that would have been in use um, by Spanish and French um, colonial powers here. And uh, I'm going to skip through this, but basically um, these bits operate in a pretty unique way. And that unique way leaves several points of pressure and impact that uh, leave a recognizable um, result on the skeleton. So when we find these um, osteological features in this particular specimen, we can say actually quite confidently that this animal was ridden with this type of a bit. Well, the very first thing that uh, somebody's head is going to jump to is, wow, did you find evidence of a Spanish uh, horse in foray into, into Kansas? Well, anticipating this question, we dove deeper and we used stable isotope analysis of the teeth, which preserve um, evidence of how this um, horse might have moved and the things that it might have ate and the water that it might have drank. I'm just going to blow through this here. But the main takeaway here is what we actually found is a, is a uh, signature that suggests the animal was fed with uh, maize during the winter months. So this is an animal that was foddered with an indigenous crop um, and integrated into pre-existing indigenous um, management systems. So this absolutely was, uh, was not another lost Spanish horse, but instead what we have here is an animal that was used for mounted riding with Spanish equipment um, and fed with indigenous crops. Okay, so as we begin to pull all these data points together, um, what we're starting to see is that uh, we have a data set that can, that can counteract some and fill in some of the biases inherent in the historic record. And just to kind of point out the way that the results from that may differ, here you can see a little bit of radiocarbon modeling uh, we've done where um, by the time we get to the middle of the 17th century here, our, our archeological results are suggesting in fact that uh, horses were already out of Spanish New Mexico and uh, going in, in every direction here and probably purely through indigenous uh, networks of exchange, social mechanisms, rather than any sort of um, lost, forgotten Spanish activity. Um, and we really don't know what the limits of this approach may be. We really don't know how rapid or how widespread or how significant this process may have been. You know, our, our ongoing work now is trying to extend uh, this research design northward to see what else we may be able to learn. So to conclude, I just, I want to say that I think this work shows us that zooarchaeology or archaeozoology, as I, I prefer to say, is really a powerful tool for telling us aspects of the early history of human and humans and horses that are not captured by the admittedly flawed um, and sort of colonial bias of, of the historic record. Um, unsurprisingly, the results that we get from this work are actually tend to agree with uh, systems of indigenous knowledge. The work shows us that there's an archaeological record out there, but a lot of it may already be misclassified into things like paleontological collections, sometimes because of accident, sometimes because of the pre-existing assumptions um, of 
those who discovered it, like this, this guy walking down the beach in, in 1910. Um, these horse remains are telling us a different story than you might get from the historical record. They show us that the spread of horses was rapid and predated the Pueblo Revolt. They reveal a early sophisticated breeding management uh, of horses. They reveal horse pastoralism, horse riding. And uh, I think we're just beginning to uh, scratch the surface of the clues that, they, um, that these horse remains may teach us. Um, as we expand our work into things like um, uh, horse DNA, and as we begin to find ways to merge our data sets with uh, other kinds of information, like indigenous systems of knowledge, um, I think that we are going to um, find that zooarchaeology has, has the ability uh, to really expand uh, what we know about the, the early human horse story um, much further than, than we've done here. And finally, why is this important? Well, I think that the, um, you know, the, the archaeological and the indigenous narratives here are telling us that the story that we tell about people and horses in this part of the world is wrong. Um, history has tended to deny the antiquity of the spread of horses and minimize the um, innovations and contributions of indigenous societies. If we want to do things like study the long-term ecological or cultural impact of horses, we need to get these things right, right? And we need to, uh, we need to counteract those biases. So I think that this type of work uh, shows promise as one tool to help us get there. And I'm really looking forward to um, finding new ways um, to connect this work uh, with our indigenous partners um, to see what directions that it may take us going forward. And in doing so, to kind of develop an inclusive scientific approach that will help bring our narratives here closer to the truth. Okay, so that's all I have to say uh, for, uh, for now. I'd like to thank those that have funded the work and some of our research partners. Before I field some questions, I just want to make a couple of quick plugs. One is uh, we do have a great digital exhibit. If you can't hold off until um, our physical exhibit opens on Monday, uh, the digital exhibit has a number of cool 3D models. You can kind of look at some of the uh, objects in our collection that illustrate uh, that human horse story a little bit. Some of them have these nice, neat little annotations. The digital exhibit also um, has some interactive components that you won't find in the physical halls, like a, um, an ASL overview in American Sign Language. And we've actually got it online in both um, English and in Espanol también. Um, so uh, that, that is the URL there, um, or you can just find it at this, the CU Museum website here. And then finally, uh, really important, if this topic was interested, uh, interesting to you, but you really tired of hearing like a white guy archaeologist ramble, um, we're going to have a really wonderful lecture next week at 7 p.m. Um, a friend of mine, Mr. Christopher Chavez, he's um, the tribal historic preservation officer for the Pueblo of Santo Domingo in New Mexico. Um, he's also just a fantastic storyteller uh, with a ton of experience. Um, with horses and, and otherwise, he's going to talk a little bit about the role of horses in, in Pueblo culture and Pueblo history in, in the American Southwest. So with that, uh, I will stop talking and open it up to some questions here. Okay, so I've got two Q&A in the official Q&A, and then uh, I do see some things in the chat so i'll i'll try to um thank you everyone for those that are checking out now thank you so much for attending um first question comes from kate mcquade who says when you interpret the damages to bone like with the young horse's broken nose do you consult with veterinarians the answer to that is yes definitely so one of the interesting challenges here of this sort of work is that veterinarians are typically used to working with live animals and we're 
as archaeozoologists, often working with the very, very dead animals, right? Um, and so uh, understanding what a particular weird bone problem might mean often <laughs> requires this very weird melding of the minds where uh, the osteological knowledge has to be combined with the expertise of uh, livestock veterinarians. I'm very fortunate that I actually have several of these in my own family. So <laughs> I've actually published uh, papers with my uncle and my sister uh, who are both uh, veterinarians. But we almost always end up seeking out some kind of a specialist in one aspect of uh, or another of equine veterinary care. Um, you know, horse dentistry, for example, that uh, is a pretty niche field. And so um, ultimately answering those kind of questions uh, involves uh, a ton of partnership, back and forth, creativity uh, with veterinarians, with archaeologists, um, and with many other folks. Um, okay, I think I did that one. Um, all right, Ellen asks, is there any chance that horses could have come across from Mongolia either with or without humans? Okay, so this is a good question. Um, let me, uh, I don't know if I want to cycle through the whole PowerPoint, but I want to get a map back up. Um, so horses, funnily enough, the, the unique aspect of studying horses in North America is that wild horses actually evolved um, in the grasslands of North America. And so while they uh, horses were certainly domesticated for the first time in the steppes of Eurasia. The animals themselves actually oh, went a bit too far. Uh, animals themselves actually evolved here. And so um, one of the things that there's been some interesting scholarship on recently is the dispersal. The initial, how do horses get over here to Eurasia where they were domesticated, right? Um, that uh, process appears to, I mean, it's a little bit complicated, but it appears to have happened, you know, within the last um, couple of million years and perhaps in, in several events. Um, and then the return of domestic horses is essentially a long um, multi-million year sort of global circumnavigation, right? Um, again, through, um, through the Atlantic side of things. Now, is there any possibility that uh, domestic horses were also reintroduced this way in addition to Spanish and French and British um, options? Some folks do speculate that Russian activity in the 19th century might have brought some horses different areas. At the moment, we don't have any evidence for it, but uh, something that I think as we generate these um, horse DNA uh, data sets that we might be able to answer in slightly uh, better detail in the future. Um, Dan says, what was the horse dentistry that was practiced by Mongolians early on? Uh, let's see if we can get to a picture here. Okay. Uh, you're basically looking at it right here in this picture. This is actually uh, the, the reason that we started to wonder about horse dentistry in the past is recognizing through some of our friends and colleagues who raise livestock today that folks do uh, remove um, a kind of a, a deciduous tooth that sometimes appears and sometimes doesn't. Um, I mean, for those that that no horses, this, uh, you'll immediately know what I'm talking about here. We call it the wolf tooth, right? But basically, um, it's a tooth that sometimes pops up into that interdental space where you uh, would otherwise have a metal bit, right? And so when it comes in, uh, it can be banging into that tooth. It can cause problems. And uh, it's typical veterinary practice to remove it. Well, Mongolians also remove it. Um, 
and they have pretty sophisticated surgical knowledge of the anatomical structures involved. Um, it seems that they started doing that a long time ago, at least almost 3,000 years ago. Um, the other thing that folks were doing is as uh, those baby teeth, the milk teeth were coming in, sometimes they would come in wrong, right? And, and a baby tooth that's erupting incorrectly and kind of jutting out into the horse's grinding surface can cause a bunch of behavioral problems, feeding problems, can also probably cause problems with the bridal equipment. Um, and it seems like the very earliest dental practice was actually focused on removing those particular teeth. Okay. Uh, those are the only questions that I see in the chat. So um, yeah, if, uh, if there are any other questions, you know, um, I, usually after a talk, folks end up emailing me or uh, something like that. I'm, I'm always happy to talk um, over email. I would mostly encourage you Oh, I finally got a, a question from Tunga who says, uh, what's your favorite kind of horse? Well, I'm pretty partial to the Mongolian horse. Um, that's, believe it or not, that's where I learned how to ride a horse. Most of the things I know about horses really just uh, come from things that have been shared with me in Mongolia. Um, and so that, yeah, uh, please for, oh, it's Peter. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, please feel free to reach out. Uh, please feel free to, uh, I encourage you all to come by and check out our new exhibit. And please uh, remember as a final plug before we wrap it up, I will try to pull up uh, Mr. Chavez's slide here one more time. Um, please do try to make time uh, exactly same time slot, I believe next week, 7 p.m. Um, if it's gonna be a great talk and a different perspective from somebody uh, who has a lot more um, to offer on, on the indigenous side of things. So um, I encourage you all to attend if you're able um, to this event next Tuesday, September 28th at seven. Um, all right, so Dan, I'll talk to you about riding your chariots later. <laughs> Thank you all for coming and um, look forward to seeing you at our event next week.